A new year is like a new story, like a new love, like a fresh beginning, an ability to see all of the best potential, to look ahead with bright eyes, to new horizons, to strive to new heights, and to recognize the reflection that the past year has taught and brought, and how we can use that to better inform our next choices, our next adventures, our next journeys, and the stories we'll get to tell because of it. On Storytelling with Seth, the end of this past year, 2019, became very eventful. There was so much going on, I struggled to keep up with it, which meant it was harder for me to share all of the great things that were happening with you. I'm lucky that I now have this time before we kick off Storytelling with Seth 2020 to look back on some of my favorite highlights a few that I'm thankful I get to share with you. Whether it's Bill Protzman, or interviewing Mark Guggenheim, or talking with Cami Garcia about what it means to have a father as a police officer and all of the things that can bring to being raised as the daughter of one. It was a really wonderful time, and there were so many great insights that I'm lucky that I get to work with an amazing team over at DC Comics News, whether it's hanging out with the podcast team on a weekly basis or recording my weekly episodes of The Spinner Rack. So, please sit back and enjoy some of my favorite highlights from 2019 and the wonderful people and stories that made 2019 as memorable and unforgettable as so many years that have come before and the memories we look to make in the years that are ahead. And what that process looks like in the hands of someone like Bill, an IT entrepreneur, a classically trained musician who has been performing for most of his life and holds magna cum laude degrees in piano performance and creative writing. And how music here, which is now, since 2011, a for-profit corporation dedicated to teaching practical ways that music can be used for self-care. In our conversation, I had the chance to explore a bit of Bill's music background, the concepts of leaking emotions and responsibility that comes with authenticity, the powerful moving moments that helped him recognize the releasing magic we are all capable of, and identifying the music that we need, whether it's in business, working with the homeless or veterans, and the idea behind a silver bullet playlist. As he pointed out at one moment, it's an emotional ride, but thankfully with his research and discussing ideas like the personal playlist. We also had the chance to touch on some high points, like his recording of Amazing Grace, which topped the charts of mp3.com in 2000. And then we ended with some great ideas about courageously animating other lanes, caring for ourselves, and more importantly, where to start. I really felt this was a valuable conversation and one that I think I'm still learning from and happy to share with you. Thanks for joining me and my discussion today with Bill Protzman. Because it takes about four songs to take us through the emotional ride, like starting at wherever you are and then elevating that ride on, perfect, on purpose, elevating the emotions, and then letting them go, releasing them. And if you think carefully about music that you love, you'll find that almost every song has those four sort of components in it. If there's an introduction, then there's a slow move up the emotional curve, then the, then the emotions peak, and then they relax a little bit. And that, that component of music, the emotional um, journey through a song or through a series of songs, it's that way because that's how we work. And, and this is a lousy analogy, but if you think about things like sex or food, um, there's a progression there that results in satisfaction. And it's, it's normal for us to want to experience things that way. Same with emotions. 
stuffing them, not so great. <laughs> but throw a little Silver Bullet playlist in there and you can have a full experience of anxiety without having it affect you. Instead, it will just flow through you and you can be at a neutral place where you're ready for the next thing. That's, that's the beauty of teaching. it. And yes, it works for post-traumatic stress. I'm, I'm a trauma survivor myself. It, it definitely works for homeless people who need to just be able to dial down and focus. It's like, oh my gosh, there's so much going on in a homeless person's life. You wouldn't think this, but just to be able to get something to eat every day is like a, a journey over how many different bus rides and you know walking blocks and whatever just to be able to find three things to eat that's complexity that most people who are living indoors don't have to face every day and staying on point to make all of that happen plus whatever else you're trying to do if you're transitioning back to being housed it's it's a whole mess of government paperwork and well-meaning people want to help you but have to measure how you're doing and oh it gets really complex so there's a lot of stress and homelessness that's has to do with ending it, you know, just as a person trying to get out of it. Music is a really great way to be able to to downregulate from some of that anxiety and stress and stay focused and move through the day. And of course, because there's lots of behavioral health issues that exist in homelessness and other places too, music can be a great way to sort of stay on your game when the triggers start or when you when you start to feel like everything's beginning to spin allowing that spin to just dissipate to music and come back to where you are, where you need to be for the next thing. A uh, very safe and effective way to do that with music. Do me a favor, go to imdb.com, type in his name and check out his profile picture, and then pose the question to yourself that my good friend Steve J. Ray from DC Comics News asked all of us in a follow-up conversation. Would you interview this man? It's probably one of the most impressive, if not intimidating, photos I have ever seen on an IMDb profile. Something we get to talk with Mark about, among so many other things, including his role as a writer in both comics and television, as a producer, consultant, as the mastermind behind so many of the great things that have come through DC Comics on the CW Network. And also the most recent crossover, Crisis on Infinite Earths. There are many things we got to talk with Mark about, and here is just a highlight of some of my favorite moments. Kick off with uh, Seth, and away you go, brother. Thank you, Mark. Uh, actually, this question comes from my nephew, Marco, who when I told him I would be on with you and what you do, the, the first thing that came out of his mouth, and then he later reaffirmed it with a text to my wife today, was, why, why did they take Hawkman and Hawkgirl off of DC Legends of Tomorrow? To which I could only imagine you get questions like that all the time. So I'll allow you your best crack at this one, um, and I'm sure he'll be thrilled to hear your answer, whatever it might be. Good question. Um, you know, it felt like their story was told, you know? Um, and I will admit, like, I don't know if we always, you know, nailed that story. Um, it, it, it's a weird combination and it's, it's gonna sound kind of like, you know, BS, but it, it happens to be the truth. It's like, sometimes you have these stories that like, you tell it, you finish it. And it's like, yeah, this is, this is not great. Like, this is, this, we didn't quite hit all the beats or the, the story itself was never working even from jump. And you can either, you know, double down and like, okay, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna continue, not even continue telling the story. I'm gonna basically tell a new story because I've already finished this story. Or you can kind of cut your losses and, and move on. And that's, that's basically what we, we decided to do. Um, you know, we, we basically, you know, found, uh, you know, we found ourselves in a situation where like, we were thinking about season two and we we're like, what are we gonna do with the Hawks? And we basically felt like, yeah, the story's been told. Like, you know, they've, they've recovered their, you know, they, they've recovered their memories, they've recovered their love for each other. And, um, you know, it, it's done, you know, it's kind of just done. You know, they, you really, this, this is a job, you know, maybe, you know, more than others where you really learn by doing. And if you don't, if you're not writing constantly 
um, you're missing out on opportunities to to you know hone and refine your craft and really learn about your process. Um, similarly, uh, I feel very strongly that reading and experiencing you know whatever sort of medium you're interested in writing in. Um, that that's really important. And I, I am a very big believer that you learn as much from the good things, the good scripts, the good episodes, the good movies, as you do from the bad ones, um, or vice versa. Um, you know, even reading a really bad script is going to be educational. If you're reading, uh, you know, I think it's, it's martial arts or Zen. I think it's Zen Buddhism, but like beginner's mind, you know, my, my advice is always read stuff with beginner's mind and, you know, leave yourself open to learning all of the lessons. Um, I feel like I read a lot of scripts just for fun. And um, I feel like I learn something every single time. Sometimes it's learning something to do. And it's sometimes it's learning something to avoid. But either way, if you if you read with the right uh, mindset, you are going to, uh, you know, learn something. It's going back to the analogy you quite rightly said earlier with music and obviously with sports that the greatest sportsmen, the greatest musicians get there because they practice, practice, practice and keep honing their craft. Yeah, uh, absolutely. The example I always use, you know, with musicians is like you know, people say, like, how many scripts do you need to start looking for an agent or something? And I'm like, well, it's not about that. It's about learning, um, you know, uh, learning the medium. Um, you know, when you first start out writing uh, any uh, screenplays, teleplays, whatever, you're you're spending so much time on the format. You're spending so much time on just the the rubric of screenwriting that I think it's very hard to do that and be fully creative at the same time. And the example I always use is, you know, there's sitting down at the piano and playing all the right notes and reading the music, but the real artistry comes in when all that stuff is second nature and you've so internalized the rubric of reading, you know, music that you can then play and, and truly perform and actually make it your own. Uh, and I feel like it's the same thing with screenwriting. It's not until you've so, you know, internalized the medium of screenwriting that you can be fully creative and therefore fully bring to the scripts your individual voice which is ultimately the thing that's going to get you the agents ultimately the thing that's going to get you you know um produced it's ultimately the thing that's going to get you repeated work it's it's not how well you have a command of screenplay format that's you know that's the, that's the given you know no one, no one's going to hire you to play carnegie hall just because you can get through you know fleur de lis um without without skipping without making a mistake you're going to get to play Carnegie Hall if you can play Fertilis in a, you know, inspired artistic manner. And how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, you practice, 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 practice. Or, you know, you can now take an Uber. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> if, yeah, well, yeah, I'm a lot more reliable than the yellow cabs. I did not say that. That was a complete slip. But thanks. Brilliant. Thank you. Seth, um, back to you, my brother. Mark, thank you for setting up my next question because I read this great interview that you gave about the process and about how you were talking about young writers need to write more than one script and that they very rarely nail it the first time, that they have to you know, take time to one master the form, then master it. And then you added something great about the artistic expression and you said you have to hone your craft and then you have to do, discover what it is that makes your voice so unique that it has to be heard, which I thought was a really important thing to uh, to focus in on. If you were going to point to it with just the, the smallest amount of looking in the mirror, self-analysis, what makes your voice unique, either as you've been told or as you define it? And can you recognize a moment when either you discovered it or you'd gotten far enough with it that you could look back and say, I think that's around the time that I was starting to recognize it or maybe have that that greater understanding with it oh that's a good question um well i'll tell you uh there was a point i started out writing with my brother eric eric uh you know is the showrunner of magnum pi um 
and the current one, not the old one. Um, <laughs> and uh, we wrote a bunch of scripts together and, you know, start off with like spec pick offenses and spec, um, you know, uh, law and order. And uh, we, we, then we did a feature and then we started writing separately because, you know, he was moving out to Los Angeles and, once he moved out there, we still were working on this one script together. We had an idea. Stop me if, if you think this is a good idea. I think this could be a, a show that could run for seven years or something. But it was about the senior staff at the White House. Um, and uh, it was called Executive Branch. Um, and believe it or not, we actually finished our draft like a week before Aaron delivered his draft of the pilot of the West Wing. Um, not great timing, but <laughs> I tell the story because I, I tell the story because um, it was during the writing of that script that I felt something unlock in me, and that I felt like I was expressing myself not just more freely, but I was expressing myself in a way that this is going to sound stupid, but that sounded like me. And it didn't sound like anybody else. And it, it's the voices the characters were speaking and sounded a lot like the voices that I hear in my own head when I'm talking to myself or whatever. Like they just, they felt familiar. So I, you know, I think in terms of, you know, in a very, very, very broad 30,000 foot kind of way, um, your voice is really what you have to say in the world, you know, and sometimes it's very specific. Like, I think if you look at Eli Stone, there were a lot of elements of that show that weren't just autobiographical, but like represented what I felt from a philosophical perspective. Um, and that's really what it comes down to. What it comes down to is, are you, are you saying something with your writing? It's, it's two things. It's, are you saying something with your writing and how are you saying it? And both of those things need to be consistent with who you are as a person. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a lot like, uh, you know, uh, Justice Potter's definition of pornography. You, you really can only, you can't describe it, but you can know it when you see it. Um, and it, it's, you, you know, it. you, you, it's a feel thing. It's a, but it, when you when it clicks, I swear it clicks. Like I, I remember very specifically the moment, you know, that it it all kind of unlocked to me. There is absolutely, I believe, an an aha moment. Um, like most skills, uh, that applies to writing, where you go, you know, yeah, I got. Now that's not to say like my evolution and my development as a writer didn't stop at that moment. In fact, it's just the opposite. It really began at that moment. Um, it was, it was, but it was only in that moment where I started to find a, a, a synergy between what I was trying to say as a writer and what, and the way I was saying it. Every day you get dailies, that's why they're called dailies. And, you know, you're getting the, the actors giving you the answers to the test. You know, they're, they're telling you basically in their performance, you know, what's working, what's not working. And you ignore that information. And it's great information. You, you ignore that at, at your peril. Kemi Garcia is a New York Times bestselling author, writer, and amazing storyteller. Those talents combine into a wonderful interview that I got to share with Kelly Gaines as part of the DC Comics News podcast team and part of our upcoming 50th episode. The great thing about talking with Kimmy was learning about how many of the things that she experienced growing up informed the writing she does now, and also about the professional contact she's made and how they continue to educate and develop the ways that she creates stories, characters, and the amazing writing we've all been lucky enough to enjoy. Most recently, she is the mastermind behind the graphic novel Raven, and during our interview, let us know that the upcoming Beast Boy would soon be taking its place on the shelves. And the conversation that we got to share with her is not only priceless, but a great example of the wonderful excitement that closed out 2019. Tune in with me right now as I share a few of my favorite highlights from our conversation and an amazing set of very interesting stories now this one just makes me smile 
Did you ever think of Wonder Woman as a gateway drug? Kimmy Garcia has a unique take on the star-spangled sovereign of truth and justice with her own mission from Themyscira and how it is that not only was it the inspiration for Kimmy's amazing Halloween costume, but how it was her introduction to Wonder Woman, comic books, and superheroes. If not, maybe just a little bit more. Let's go ahead and take a listen. I want to ask one last question about it and then make my follow-up question a, a segue a little bit sure. as we move into things about Beast Boy. But I, I love to ask this question and I, I don't always get a chance to, to ask it based on who I'm talking with and, and what the, the content they're putting out at the time is. But especially when it comes to a, a book or a, a collaboration, graphic novel, anytime someone's written something and I get the chance to read it, I get a chance to talk with them. My favorite question to ask is, is there anything that you would like me as the reader to think about, or any reader reading the book, to think about the story that you've written? It can either be a question to ask themselves, an idea to consider, or something else entirely. And I, mean, I love the gamut of, of answers, but I was curious if you had. I mean, you know, I think that, the, I think that for Raven, the thing that was most important to me that about her as a character and the thing that I kind of hope everyone can take away is that kind of, you know, there's a line where she says, I belong to myself. You know, that idea that like you can, you define yourself, like you get to be the person you want to be. And it's just a matter of whether or not you're brave enough to be that person. And I was not, as a teen, like, I was not as brave as the teens that I meet all the time at events. Like, I don't, like, they're, you know, they're much braver than I ever was. But my, my, with characters like the Titans, my thing is always, like, you know, like, embrace the things that make you special and different, you know, and, like, own that. And define yourself and don't let other people tell you what you have to be or what you can't do. You know, like, don't buy into that. And now for a personal highlight, a highlight that reflects a project I've been working on for quite some time, a short story that after a few attempts, more than a few, I realized I no longer wanted to make this story about publishing or commercial success, but I did want it to be a story with a message. It's a message I believe that can be shared in more than one way on more than one platform. And that's why after turning it into a short story that's available to be purchased and downloaded online, I then recorded an audio version of that. And I believe, according to the notification I received, that the final stages are in play for that audio version to now be available with the short story. To go with that, I have this sample that was required as part of the publication process and publishing process and I'm here to share it with you to not only one tease what will be the completed audio version of that story but also to get your feedback and things I might want to consider for other pieces that I've composed that might have a quality that could benefit from audio storytelling and I just never considered. Looking to hear your feedback and your thoughts this is the sample for This is a Language of Fizz, now available online and soon as an audio story. Mike picks me up three hours before the fights and weaves the rust brown accord through low clouds and light fog on Highway 132 bearing east. The Old County Road kills commuters in the double digits every year and an unbroken train of drivers and cars tailing each other at a distance closer than two lengths must figure this shorter drive is worth the risk. The interior of the car is quiet. He exits at Mays Boulevard and cuts through Modesto's downtown traffic. At the Fat Cat, we show our driver's licenses to a big local boy in new jeans in front of the open red door. The sleeves on his untucked green button-down are rolled up past the elbow and a thick forearm and biceps gleam with the sweat of a worker's tan as he brings my license closer. He studies my face and then looks back at the card. 
His left leg and shoulder fill the doorway while he hesitates and then finally steps aside to let us in. He glances at Mike's ID and then looks back at me. I nod and we walk in. We walk over a red carpet once plush, now mottled by beer stains and bleached patches. Between the blood, the visible vomit, and liquor combinations, I can only imagine what that whitewash did obliterate. A man in a black t-shirt and jeans sets up behind the wooden bar on the right. I feel like I'm the only one who sees the boxing ring, a box that has been built on top of the black and white tiled dance floor. I want to dance above that floor. The cocktail tables have been draped with maroon tablecloths and tagged with VIP placards and moved onto the stage where cover bands usually perform. Ice clinks in a metal washbin and there is a murmur of muffled conversation drifting from a hallway in the back. The grip of well vodka and gin is thick. I am going to dance on that floor. Karen is a short boxing promoter wearing a low-cut purple sweater over round curves. She sits next to a guy with glasses at the table in front of the ring. The fights are held on the first Tuesday of every month, and every time Karen says the name of the guy with the glasses, and every time I forget. How's our champ today, she asks, tilting her chin up with a smile. Ready to put on a show. All right, you're checked in. Get weighed, and then we'll see you upstairs. She leans over and blocks the view of the glasses guy's receding hairline to check off my name. Mike steps back and takes his time staring down at the table. I turn my eyes up to the balcony railings, tracing three sides of the ring. In two hours, both floors will boil with friends and drunks and friends of the other guy talking shit and looking for a fight and so many girls screaming at each swing or shove. On the fourth wall above the stage, a seven by ten foot span of plexiglass offers a one-way mirror for the fighters. Once they weigh in downstairs and get a Polaroid taken, those amateurs are sent upstairs to a room wrapped in cheap red and gold parlor wallpaper with a ragged pale green carpet splattered with stain. In the first hour, at least 15 wannabes will be roaming around the room. They wander about with their gym bags or plastic grocery bags filled with the sows and ace bandages or pills, appearing to those outside as outlines and featureless shapes. If 30 fighters show, then it is a full card night. Every competitor is required to have a mouthpiece and show it. Some bring a buddy or a trainer and use their own target pads to warm up. I carry a tattered blue messenger bag with a water bottle, a janky disc man set on repeat to Brother Lynch Hung's Spitz Network, a leather jump rope with wooden handles, repelling rope for practicing knots, and a copy of the Tao Te Ching because it's the only thing that slows my breathing when the adrenaline starts to spike. Then, after getting hands wrapped and taped by the volunteer corner men, Max and Frank, and checked out by the doctor, everybody sits along the wall and across the floor waiting. Visitors will pop in, friends who want to lend moral support, and girlfriends trying to give one more good luck kiss, peek in and believe in those moments that they are doing something that will count or make a difference in the night or the fight. Everyone dreams of a Hollywood finish, but this is not the place. Anyone who has a dream ending, replete with fog, theme music, and a spotlight scheduled for tonight, has already lost. Two days before, I was killing myself, getting ready for that green room. By the third step, my heart beyond pounding. Bump, 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 bump. Two days before, I was a machine. I drove my legs into the concrete, pictured aluminum brush pistons throttling together in one synchronous movement. Heard the thundering hiss of each joint slide at whistling speeds a hair's breadth from surrounding cylinders. This was a 2.3 mile run around the subdivision that is my prison. This is what boxers call road work. I always wanted to be a boxer. And if you want to hear more, that was This is a Language of Fists, now available on Amazon as both a text story and an audio story. Pick your favorite, pick both, share them with everyone, tell a friend, and then tell me what you like, what you're expecting more of, what you would like to see that you know I've written as an audio story, and let me know how much you want to see it so I know which story to turn into an audio story next. Thanks again for all your feedback and for taking the time to listen.
And that brings this episode of Storytelling with Seth to a close. It allows us to finish looking back on 2019, those frantic weeks, heading into December, where I got the chance to talk with Bill Protzman, Mark Guggenheim, and Cami Garcia, and how now I get to let you know about expectations for the future, including my audio project for This is a Language of Fists, an audio and short story compilation and presentation. There's a lot of opportunities ahead for us. A little teaser for you. I have on the agenda a conversation with Daniel Fingeroth for the upcoming Will Eisner Week, and then a chance to sit down with Christina Duverne and talk with her about Beautiful Disaster, a clothing line inspired by a mission and the motivation for change. I look forward to sharing these and so many more new episodes with you here on Storytelling with Seth. Just a reminder, you can find me on all your favorite social media platforms with the hashtag Storytelling with Seth, or just go ahead and pick your favorite platform to connect with me directly, whether it's One More Singleton on Twitter, or Seth the Writer on Instagram, or if you just want to find me on Facebook or through my website, Seth Singleton Storyteller. I try to keep it with those three S's, and I try and keep the focus on Seth and the Storyteller. Hopefully that makes it easy for you to find, and if you haven't yet, please subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. I'm just about everywhere. So once you do, rate and review, let me know how I'm doing, what you're thinking, and what kind of content or stories you would like to hear here on Storytelling with Seth. Think you've got a story that we should be talking about on Storytelling with Seth? Well, go ahead and reach out to me on one of those contact channels. Let me know what you're thinking, what I should be hearing, and we can talk about all the ways to share your next story with us right here. Thanks again for tuning in. Looking forward ahead with a lot of inspiration after having the chance to look back on what has been a great year of great conversations and a great collection of stories. See you next time. Click the link below to subscribe now to Storytelling with Seth or look for it on your favorite podcast platform.